This is the full blessing of God, the presence of God. And so justification very quickly means you're justified. It's a legal term. Justification means that you have been forgiven of your sin and you are saved. You know, and I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Sanctification means spiritual cleansing. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit that you experience sanctification, spiritual cleansing. And of course, number three, the Holy Spirit baptism means when power comes upon you. Power from God, Holy Spirit baptism. I'm going to get into that in just a minute here. The full blessing from the Lord it's which I believe is to be a three-step process. And I pray that this will bring clarity to your own understanding and your walk with Jesus and where you are right now. Again, some of you can be confused. Some people in the church think that they are not baptized in the Spirit because they don't speak in tongues. Has anyone ever experienced that kind of feeling before? You may not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues or, or you've heard that. The evidence of being baptized in the Spirit is that you speak in tongues. And I'm going to tell you, I don't agree with that. And there's a lot of people that do not agree with that as well. Y'all have heard me say before, evidence that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit is that the fruit of the Spirit is produced in your life. And that's where you'll find in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. Now, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10 says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will what? Be saved. For with your heart a person believes, for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. Everyone who is a Christian has been justified. Number one, justification. God can't deal with you. God can't work through you. God can't do anything until you get to go through justification. Justification. You've been justified. That moment when you met Jesus, you asked Him to forgive you of your sin, and He came into your life, you asked Him to be your Lord and Savior, you were justified. Did we get a little feedback with the microphone? Okay, I don't know. But anyways, that's what justification means. Justification. Number two, sanctification. This is pretty deep here, what we're getting ready to get into, so I want you to really hear me out. A good example of what justification means is the thief on the cross. As the thief was dying on the cross, he had no time to experience water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, nothing like that. The thief that was on the cross dying with Jesus Christ, he looked at Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had no time to take part in church services, to anything. He was at death's door within several minutes. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That is a prime example of justification. You have been justified. Every Christian has had that divine moment like the thief on the cross with Jesus Christ. You've been justified. Now, it's meant for the Christian, if they live unlike the thief on the cross, to move into step two. And that is known as sanctification. Now, sanctification is a spiritual cleansing. It's a continual work in the Christian it's a continual work of the Holy Spirit until you pass in the glory. What does that mean, until you pass in the glory? Meaning when you die or you get raptured and you leave this earth, you go to heaven when you go on to glory. That's what that means, okay? I'm giving you all some religious terms here, okay? But sanctification is the work that the Holy Spirit does in a Christian inside, starts cleaning out the spiritual house. That's what sanctification means. And that is a work that will happen until the day you are gone from this world. It's an everlasting work. For example, a Christian now understands that they shouldn't be doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this. Why? Because that is the Holy Spirit working in them, revealing things to them. Now, for some people, they go through that sanctification process very rapidly and they move pretty far. They cover a lot of ground. For some Christians, they have a hard time with it they're struggling with sanctification work that the Holy Spirit is doing in their life. They don't, they don't, how do you say, they, they quench the Spirit of God. That's why the Bible says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. That's why God has instituted His church in the form of evangelists, pastors, teachers, apostles, prophets, that they feed through the Holy Spirit. They feed the church and the church gets edified through the teachings of, of the Holy Spirit through man, 
through the office of the church, and we begin to learn. We take the word, and it, it begins to cleanse our mind. I'm getting ready to go somewhere with this. The word of God cleanses you. And see, for every person, it's different. For every person, you, when, when every Christian that is justified, you've been justified, you've been saved, but when you get into that phase two, Christian, of sanctification work, you begin to understand that, okay, I, I need to surrender this because I know this is what I used to do before I was a Christian and now that I'm a Christian, this doesn't belong in my life. Some of us can hinder that work and some of us can just, man, we learn it, we accept discipline, we, in, we accept instruction and we go forward and we learn. The third step is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, some Christians have not been baptized in the Spirit of God. I'm talking about having that day of Pentecost experience. What I mean by that is that baptism of, of receiving not only the gift of the Holy Spirit, but also to be able to have the fruit of the Spirit manifested in them. See, Jesus said something, that when the Spirit came upon you, that you would receive power. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to really understand something here. The disciples, we look at them, how they walked with Jesus three years, okay? Now, this is a lot of Christians today. And the disciples walked with Jesus for three years. And at the end of those three years, Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. I mean, that was, that was the reality of three years of walking with Jesus. And that's the reality of some Christians today. That at the end of their life, you know, that they may deny Jesus. They may say, I don't know him. But they were going through a sanctification process. Because if you remember... It was so important for Peter to do this. Peter, I believe, just like the rest of the disciples, there was a point in the gospel where Peter, Jesus asked them, do you want to leave? Do you want to go too? Because a lot of people were abandoning Jesus. And Jesus said in the gospels, he looked at Peter and the disciples, the 11, he said, do you want to leave? And Peter said, but you are the son of God. You know, Jesus said, who do you say I am? Y'all remember this in the gospels? Jesus said, who do you say I am? And, the, and Peter and the disciples, they said, you're the son of God. Where else can we go? You know, they were saying that at that moment, I believe the disciples, you know, that said that and believed that they were justified. They had just entered into that justification stage. In John chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus has already spoken to them. He's worked with them. And he says in John 15, 3, he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Jesus was saying Y'all have been with me a certain time. Y'all have been justified because you said I am the Son of God. You believe that. But uh, y'all have been with me a certain time. And Jesus said, I've been speaking to you. And Jesus said, the word which I've been speaking to you, it says now, Jesus says, you're clean now. You're clean. Even though several chapters down from John 15, we start to see the betrayal. And Peter deny him. And Judas betray him. You know, G Judas was not clean. You know, Judas, I mean, of Jesus said, all of you are clean except for one of you. And he was speaking about Judas. Judas had not accepted that Jesus was the Son of God. But the other 11 did. So they had went from, from being justified to go through a three-year process of being sanctified. And now Jesus says towards the end of his life, he tells them, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now in John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus died. And Jesus rose from the dead. Now I'm going to move quickly here. He rose from the dead and he spoke to them and he said this. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. They, he, the Holy Spirit was not able to come upon man until Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus had already risen from the dead when he breathed the Holy Spirit on them. But they had not received it yet. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is about to be taken back up into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8, it says this, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father, which the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of, from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking Jesus, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive, here you go, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. 
Now, Jesus was making a, Jesus was showing the entire church how he did it with his disciples. And this is the mode I believe that the church has to follow. It is. They were justified. Lord, you are the Son of God. They were sanctified. He breathed on them after he rose from the dead. You're clean. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it wasn't until after Jesus left back up to heaven. It went until Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, where they're gathered together and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They are now baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where a lot of Christians today have not been baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's read this. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to be tongues of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, it's important to understand here. Evidence that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit, is not speaking in tongues. Because we're going to see some things here in a little bit. But evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you is not, and, and I believe in speaking, in, I believe in the all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. They function today in the church. But it is not the evidence that you are been baptized and controlled and led by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience and so on, from love to self-control. When the Holy Spirit is doing a working in you, and you experience, you once were not a man of self-control, you once were not a woman of peace, but now you are because you're walking in the Spirit of God. That says that the Holy Spirit is in you. He's working in you. He has control of you. He's got the attention of your mind, of your hands, of your tongue, and the Holy Spirit is moving in you. You have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. The power. What does the baptism of the Holy Spirit mean, guys? What does the baptism of the Holy Spirit mean? It means power. It means God gives the Christian power. In order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you must be a Christian. You cannot be anything else. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is because it comes upon a Christian and that God gives them power. That's exactly what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 you will receive power. That's why a lot of Christians are not living in the power of God today because they have not surrendered fully to the sanctification work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe before, the Holy, before you're baptized in the Spirit of God, now please hear me on this, before you're baptized in the Spirit of God, you've got to go through a certain time amount of sanctification, of Holy Spirit working in you to cleanse the temple. I've got a perfect imagery of this and I'll show it to you in just a minute. As a matter of fact, let me just do this right now. The, 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 the tabernacle in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, it consisted of three layers. Number one being the court of tabernacles. That's where the brazen altar was found. Number two was the golden altar. And then number three as you moved into the depths of the, tab of the temple, it was, it was the Holy of Holies. That's where the actual presence of God was, the Holy of Holies. When Jesus died on the cross, Matthew chapter 27 says that when Jesus died on the cross, it says that the, the foundation of the temple cracked. And it says that the curtain that was in the temple, uh, the Holy of Holies, that separated the golden altar and the brazen altar from the going into the Holy of Holies. Because in that day, you could not step into the Holy of Holies, into that little inner room. A curtain had separated from man from going in there. If you went in there and you were not sanctified, you would die. And Jewish tradition teaches that once a year, a priest, a Jewish, a Jew, the Pharise one of the Pharisees, the head, the chief Pharisee, they would tie a rope around him. And he would have to sanctify himself for a certain period of time. He would ask God to forgive him of his sins. And he would, they had spirit, Jewish laws that they wouldn't touch pork and stuff like that. And once a year, the, the, the chief uh, priest would take the sacrifice of a spotless animal, a male, and he would take the blood and he would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And they'd tie a rope around him. Why? Because when he would go in there, if he went right with God and he's in the presence of God, he would drop dead. And therefore, they knew he dropped dead. They'd have him, a rope around him. They'd just pull him on out. 
Now, it's important to understand that when Jesus died on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, it says that the, the curtain, which was beyond the Holy of Holies, that that curtain ripped from top to bottom. It ripped open. The Holy Spirit of God, which had been in there, so to speak, had come out into the world, into the hearts of men. The Holy Spirit was no longer in the Holy of Holies. So that's very important to understand what I'm teaching you tonight about how a Christian goes from justification, the sanctification, to experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can understand that process, three-step process, by looking at the temple of God. At the temple of God was the brazen altar, the outer layer, the very first outer layer. The brazen altar was known. There was a mound hill. Now watch this. Watch the imagery. Watch the, how it's very, it very closely resembles the work of Jesus Christ. When you would go into the, into the court of tabernacles where the brazen altar was, there was four horns there. And that's where you would take an animal sacrifice and that's where you would take its blood and you would sacrifice it for the sins. For the sins. Now follow me on this. That altar was on a mound hill. It was earth ground, but it was on a mound. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he was on a mound too. Okay? At the cross of Jesus, you're justified. You're forgiven of your sins. This is where justification is found in the temple at the first level. The brazen altar. Okay? Once you go beyond the brazen altar in the temple, you go to the golden altar. Okay, now the golden altar represents the sanctifying work that the Holy Spirit does in a Christian today. Watch this. In the golden altar, there's another altar there with four horns. And we're to bring another sacrifice in there of an animal and its blood, a, a, a perfect male, spotless, without blemish. And in the golden altar, in the second part of, the, of this temple, Incense burned day and night. And it was the chief priests would allow the incense to burn day and night. So that way, that was a pleasing aroma to God. Because just beyond the golden altar was the Holy of Holies. But watch this. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, now this is so hard, that this is something I really want you to understand. Don't get lost on me on this. In the book of Revelation, when God is about to hurl down the final judgments onto the earth, He takes the prayers of the saints and mixes it with incense. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And He gets it and He casts it on the earth and it brings forth judgment upon all the unrighteous. Incense is some, it's, it's, it's something that only the priests could do, could do for God. That they, that they had the, these long chains with these balls, these, these metal balls with, 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 with burn, burning incense in there. And as they would do this, smoke would come around. And it would bring forth, like, uh, uh, resemble the Holy Spirit moving. And so this is so important because this golden altar, it's, it goes hand in hand with the second process of a Christian, meaning sanctification. Meaning the golden altar, we've been exposed as a Christian. We've been exposed to the, to the gold of God, which is the royalty of Jesus. And now Jesus, we can pray to Jesus. Amen as a Christian? We can, before, we're, and the Bible says God does not hear all prayers. God hears the prayers of the righteous, but the wicked, his ear is far away from them. That's in the book. Look for that scripture. God hears the prayers of the righteous, but, hear, but his ear is far from the wicked. What does that mean? Yes, God hears all people, but God will not move his hand for the unrighteous. But for the righteous, God does move his hand. Find that scripture that's in the word of God. Now, the Holy of Holies, when you go beyond the golden altar, you go into the Holy of Holies, and that's where the temple of God was. And that is where we find the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a three-step process, guys. In Acts chapter 9, I want to show you something. It's a three-step process. When you're justified, you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. God forgives you. You begin a new relationship with Jesus Christ. You've been justified. It's a legal term. Now you move into a sanctification process, which will continue till the day you die, Christian. But it's so important to understand that after you've been going through this sanctifying work, 
eventually God wants you to experience the third blessing, which is the Holy Spirit baptism. And again, this does not necessarily mean you're going to speak in tongues. Although I believe that it is something that does bring forth evidence. Now, in Acts chapter 9, y'all recall Paul's. I'm not going to go through all this word for word, but I'm going to just recall because y'all should know these, this, this Bible. Paul was a Pharisee. He was killing Christians, okay? This is found in Acts chapter 9. Paul was killing Christians, but he became a believer on the road to Damascus. How did that happen? He met Jesus. He was blinded for three days. And we find here that Ananias was told by God to go and lay hands on Saul so that he can receive his sight again. It says in, here in verse, uh, let me read this, Acts chapter 19, verse 17. It says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight, and here you go, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from Saul's eyes something like scales, and Saul regained his sight, and he got up, and he was baptized, and he took food, and he was strengthened. He experienced water baptism, but it says nothing here that he experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it was God's intention that Saul would eventually experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a major difference. Now, it says here, now for several days, he was with the disciples and who were at Damascus. And immediately, Paul, Saul began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. That's all Paul could say because he had just been justified. And when you're justified, you know Jesus is the Son of God. And that's all he could say at that time. But it says here that he began to grow very quickly in the faith. Verse 21, it says, All those who were hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not the one who is in Jerusalem destroying those who called on the name of Jesus? Who He came here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests, but Saul kept increasing in strength and he kept confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. That's all Paul could do because he had not been taught anything else about Jesus. He just knew that Jesus was the Christ. If you want to do your history, from this point on, Saul went into hiding for three years. For three years after this moment, because he wanted to proclaim, Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. They wanted to kill this crazy man. In the eyes of the world, he was a crazy man. But God has a process of how he brings someone from darkness into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God does a process of it. So if, what happened here, when Saul did this, they wanted to kill him. They took Saul to Jerusalem. Read the book. They took Saul to Jerusalem. They wanted to kill him. They said, Saul, go back to your hometown. It was three years later when we find out about Saul coming back onto the scene again. Saul went into hiding for three years and he began, the Holy Spirit began to sanctify him. Again, how long did the disciples walk with Jesus? Talk to me, church. How, uh, come on, how long? Three years. The disciples walked with Jesus three years and at the end of those three years, Jesus told them, now receive the Spirit. And what else did he tell them? He said, the word I've spoken to you has cleansed you. It's the same timetable with Saul. Saul went into hiding and for three years he didn't preach nothing. He didn't say nothing. He says later on that he had direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Three years later, Saul becomes a missionary. Saul becomes an apostle. That's a pattern that we see. Let's look at Acts chapter 19 verse 1. This is going to really blow you away. Let me read this in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, this is years later in Paul's life, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Do you hear that? There is such thing as a believer of Jesus not receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Then what baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism. And Paul said in verse 4, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, meaning water, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. But when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Now, what does this mean? I'm going to tell you what this means. 
This means that these men were disciples of John the Baptist. They saw John the Baptist die. They saw Jesus in his three-year ministry. They saw Jesus die and, and, and heard that he rose from the dead. But they did not know nothing about this blessing of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this is something that Jesus told the disciples. You will receive power and you will go out and make disciples. And that's why Paul comes to these men several years later and it's mind baffling. But he comes to these men several years later. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. And for some time, these disciples here, they were receiving the word and the word was cleansing them. And I knew they were, you've got to know that they were living holy, righteous lives because God ordained Paul to come and meet these men, so to speak, in the middle of a road. And he asked them, do you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Have you received it? These were believers. And you know what? There's Christians today that live in the world that have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, 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 you know, and again, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus said the baptism of the Holy Spirit is power. When you have power from God. In Acts chapter 1, you find Jesus said that. You, when those, you be baptized with the Spirit, you will what? receive power. And that's why a lot of Christians do not have they not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that's why they have a lot of failure in their life and again evidence that you you have been filled with the Spirit and baptized it's not that you speak in tongues no it's not that although I do believe in all gifts of the Spirit I got to keep saying that because I want to make that point because the the, the, the Pentecostal and, and I love the Pentecostal religion I, I, I was saved through that church but the Pentecostals they have a main doctrine that teaches you must speak in tongues to, have the, to say that you've been baptized in the Spirit, and that is not true. There are many great women and men of God who've done great, powerful things for the Lord, and they've never spoken in tongues. And I've come to conclude that the evidence is the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, and so on. In Acts chapter 8, verse 34 through 39, it says here that a eunuch was traveling down the road, and he wanted to... He was reading the book of Isaiah, it says. And he was just reading the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament. And he was curious. He was coming from Jerusalem. And he was curious about the Jewish uh, religion. And he was curious about it. He was reading it. And God ordained Philip to come alongside the carriage of this Ethiopian eunuch. And this is in Acts chapter 8, verse 34 through 39. Let's read this. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say of this? Because he's reading this book. Of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began from the scripture. He preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, and Philip, with, as, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. This eunuch had just experienced justification, but he had not experienced sanctification or baptism of the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit was right there. The Holy Spirit, as they came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit snatched Philip and took him away. But that man had not received the baptism of the Spirit. Why? Because he had just been justified and he just heard about Jesus. There is a process to get to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because it's such a, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. And I've seen people who've been baptized in the Spirit of God and they go on and they, they, they fleece the flock and they lord their authority over people, and they begin to damage God's people. This is something that we should desire to experience every day of our life, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read another one. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 2, we see of a Gentile, a Roman officer. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 2. Read this with me. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius. He was a Roman. He was a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household. And he gave many alms, money to the Jewish people. And he prayed to God continually. Here was a man who had a knowledge of God. And again, he was going through that sanctification process already. 
Unlike the eunuch who had not gone through justification or sanctification, this man has already, he, he was being justified because he was given money to the Jews. He, was, he believed and he worshipped with the Jews. He understood some certain things and the Holy Spirit was already preparing him for the receiving of the baptism. This man's heart was very open. He was a Gentile accepting the Jewish way. Look what verse 44 says later on. While Peter, he goes to Peter, Peter goes to this man's house. And this man tells his whole family, Hey, come on to the house, because this man Peter who walked with Jesus, he's coming to our house, and he's going to tell us more about th this passion we have for God. So Peter shows up many, many verses later. And it says in verse 44, Peter begins to speak to them. And it says, and while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who came with Peter, meaning the Jews, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speak with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And so he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on a few more days. Two things happened. Some were speaking in tongues and some were exalting God. Now, speaking in tongues is a major thing. It really is. The Bible says, do not, you know, you know hinder that. Do not, you know, put that down. And a lot of religions, Christian religions... They hear speaking in tongues like, oh, no, 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 that's not for us. We're not the tongue speakers today. No, no, no. We just, you know, but it, it is tongues it, it is evidence. It's one of the evidences that you have the gift of the Holy Spirit because tongues falls under the gift, not under the fruit. And the reason why it was so important for these Gentiles to speak in tongues was because the Jews had came with Peter and the Jews thought, oh, well, we're, we're special. Only we could receive the Holy Spirit. And God was saying, no, 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 I'm going to pour my spirit upon everyone who believes in my son. And that's why they spoke in tongues. Because it was evident to the Jews and to anybody else that the spirit of God was really doing a work today. Now, I'm going to read one more. And this one is really going to kind of get us. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Philip was preaching in Samaria. Again, Samaria is a place where the Jews hated these Samarians. There was like a black and white racial issue here, okay? Now, in Acts chapter 8, verse 9, it says, There was a man named Simon who was formerly practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is called of the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he for a long time astonished, astonished them with his magic arts. But, but when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And he observed signs and great miracles taking place. He was constantly amazed. You have a magician here, okay? He's amazing all the people. He's a sorcerer. All of a sudden, Philip, the, the Philip the missionary, he shows up and he starts preaching Jesus Christ. And everybody starts, all of the, the Simon the sorcerer's audience starts looking at Philip. And they hear the name of Jesus. And they're like, wow. So they believe in Jesus and they accept Jesus. And they're baptized in the water. There's no baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. Simon believes. Wow. And he believes. And he's baptized in the water. So everyone believes in Jesus. And they're listening to Philip. And the word is being spoken to them. But verse 30, uh, 14 says something. Let me read this. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them, watch this, Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that why? That they might receive the Holy Spirit. They believed, they were baptized in the water, but Peter and John had to go down there so that they might receive, they might, they might, not for sure, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. In verse 16, for the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had just simply been baptized. I believe there's a lot of Christians that live like that today. They believe, and they may get into heaven, but because of, of some kind of disobedience in their heart to God, they just, they can't go that extra step and receive that final blessing, the power of God, 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look here. It says, verse 16, For he, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any one of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, Then Peter and John began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon the magician had saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Look, it don't say nothing about tongues, does it? But, but Simon saw something that allowed him to understand there was a difference. There was a difference. All of a sudden, Simon saw, apparently something happened. It may have been the evidence of speaking in tongues. It may be the evidence of boldly prophesying. Prophesying is different from speaking in tongues. But something happened where people were being baptized in the Spirit and the power of God was coming upon them. This was, you go from justification to the Word begin to work in you and cleanse you, and finally, baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a three-step process. Just like the temple, we see the illustration of, of the temple, how there's a three-phase work of the temple of God. Now, it says here in verse 19, 18, when Simon saw the Spirit was bestowed through the laying down of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Peter was saying, you cannot receive this Holy Spirit because you ain't even been justified. He was deceiving the people. Your heart is filled with iniquity. Your heart is, is full of bitterness. You know, you, you, you know, you're in the gall of bitterness. You're, you're grieved. You're still corrupted by the ways of the world. Satan still has a stronghold on you. And therefore, Peter said, you cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Meaning, Simon possibly wasn't even justified. Though he had went through the physical process of being baptized in the water and saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. Peter saw right through him and said, you can't even receive this. You better pray. But see, here's the big thing. Simon says, you pray for me. A heart that has not been humbled. You pray for me. Well, Peter said, you pray. And Simon goes, no, you pray. If you're not willing to fall on your knees and admit your wrongful ways, you cannot receive justification. You cannot enter into the process of sanctification, which is the spiritual cleansing of your body. And you can't even get the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you're, you're not humble before God. God will not just throw His Spirit upon anybody. It's a heart that has been prepared. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts to each one just as He determines. I believe in the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, it clearly says, He distributes to them as He determines. Not everybody functions in all gifts of the Holy Spirit. Another point I want to make out, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Paul says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, you hear that? There's two different kinds of tongues worldly languages and heavenly languages and Paul is saying it is possible to speak in heavenly languages unknown languages of the earth of the heavens Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal now what does that mean you can claim religion, but if you don't love, you're worthless. And that is why I believe, and this is my opinion, that evidence that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit is that the fruits of the Spirit is seen clearly in your life. And the fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control. Not all of us have it yet, do we? But we've got to see some of that in our lives. I see that in all of your lives. We may not all experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit, all fruit, but God, you know, the first one is love and the last one is self-control. And in between, there's so much more. And that is the, the, the driving factor of, of a Bible-believing church. Not that we speak in tongues and that, and that we do all these things, but that we have love, that we're uni united as one. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the promise of God's power, which falls only upon a Christian who is in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the nine gifts as well as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It all comes as the Holy Spirit wills it to the believer. Now again, clearly understand something. There's a three-step process to the full blessing of God. Let me recap this. Justification, sanctification, and the baptism of the Spirit. And we see that clearly in the temple that was in Jerusalem. There was a three stage, a three room of the temple. The first being the brazen altar. That's where you, that's where you brought forth forgiveness of sin. Justification. You're justified. When you ask God to be your Lord and Savior and forgive your sin, you're justified. And that's what we find in the temple, the brazen altar. You move into the second phase, which is the golden altar. There's four horns there as well, and you brought forth a blood sacrifice. And that was the incense that was constantly in the room there. Why? Because now you can actually talk to God. The prayers, the incense was actually the prayers where the prayers were bought, it brought into the temple, and it actually went before God. You know, you cannot speak to God unless you're a Christian. Again, what the scriptures say, the, 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 righteous, the prayers of the righteous, the Lord hears them. But the, the prayers of the wicked are far from God. He don't hear that. And that, 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 you know, God is a God of grace and mercy, mercy, but he is a God of wrath and judgment as well. Now, once, the, and, and that second, where the golden altar is, that's known as the process of sanctification. Where, when, as a Christian, we're being sanctified daily, spiritual cleansing, spiritual cleansing. Our body is a temple, amen? Amen, Christian? The Bible teaches your body is the temple of the Lord. Well, we look at the first original temple of the Lord, which was in Jerusalem. Three-stage process to get to God. And we look at our body today, and how do we experience the full power, the full blessing of God, to actually have God be, let our body be the Holy of Holies? We go through that process. We have to be justified. We have to have sanctification. Only God has to cleanse us to a certain degree where God begins to say, okay, they're ready now to come in to the full baptism of the Holy Spirit, to the Holy of Holies. Only God knows that. Only God knows when your heart is ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And again, the proof, that evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I know a lot of you may have questions, but I want, I'll pray that God is going to give you revelation. Go back and watch this teaching and receive this in Jesus' name.